Hi, I'm Vicki Kiger. I have been a research and development aerospace engineer for over 30 years and have applied my mad scientist integrated engineering principles to both growing foods and maintaining health. An important part of this is to grow and to eat healthy foods. And to do that, you need healthy ecosystems of both the soil and body. Building and maintaining healthy soil ecosystems require healthy pollinators. As a result of this wellness mission, I have a nonprofit business called Rethink Wellness, which champions lifestyle management to reduce healthcare costs. Therefore, you're going to see our logo throughout this presentation. This presentation is about creating pollinator pathways in available urban growing areas, such as alleys and easements. We also need to plant more native plants to help our pollinators. And here is an outline of today's presentation, going over who the pollinators are, why should you care about the pollinators, what is the plight of the pollinators, what is Fort Worth doing, what am I doing, in turn, what can you do? Summary and resources that I hope will be helpful to you. No doubt this audience needs little introduction to who our pollinators are. As you all know, pollinators include invertebrates and vertebrates, as well as the wind as a pollinator of crops such as grasses, rice, and maize. The most productive pollinators are the invertebrates, which include a wide array of insects, such as bees, wasps, ants, beetles, damselflies, dragonflies, flies, midges, moths, and the iconic butterflies, as well as our numerous spiders. I'm clearly not an entomologist, yet I'm trying to learn more about this fascinating world. The vertebrate pollinators include mainly birds and bats, but also some non-bat mammals, such as the monkeys, lemurs, possums, rodents, and some lizards, too. After mentioning all of the pollinators, you may ask, why should I care? Well, the next time you go grocery shopping for fruits and vegetables, you should thank a pollinator, because they are responsible for at least one-third of our food. Over 75% of flowering plants rely upon our pollinators. Without these helpers, there would be no coffee, chocolate, wine, or most of our fruits and vegetables. Let's give an a special thanks to our hard-working hard vertebrates, too, especially the bats, since they're responsible for pollinating avocados, banana, carob, cashews, cloves, dates, figs, guavas, mangoes, and let's not forget to thank the lesser long-nosed bat who pollinates the blue agave needed for the delicious adult beverage tequila. According to Forbes magazine, our pollinators add around $580 billion to the global economy. Besides our food, pollinators support healthy ecosystems which clean the air and support healthy soil. They also aid in vital plant growth along with their root systems, which in turn stabilize soils during times of drought as well as times of flooding. But our pollinators are in trouble. According to the United Nations, over 40% of our invertebrate pollinators and 16% of our vertebrate pollinators are in jeopardy of extinction. There are numerous probable causes for our pollinators being in peril, including a loss of habitat, where around 90% of our native grasslands have been destroyed by monocultured crops and urban development. Additional causes include excessive use of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. You'll be hearing that a lot from me today, as well as increased use of herbicide-tolerant GMO crops and neonicotinoid coated seeds. You'll be hearing from me, be careful in your selection of plants and seeds that you purchase. Another probable cause are predators and invasive plant species, diseases, and yes, electromagnetic fields, and the age-old climate and weather. 
As I said, our pollinators are in peril, and we can help. As you can see on this map, Texas is key to the monarch butterfly's migratory pathway, and I-35 is sometimes called the monarch highway. As most of you may know, monarchs are in trouble because of the loss of land growing their native milkweed, and that is their host plant for the caterpillar stage. Monarchs can serve as the icon representing the plight of our invertebrate pollinators, so whatever we do to help the monarchs will also help all pollinators. An amazing statistic is that 80% of the U.S. population reside on 3% of the urban land area. And Texas leads the U.S. in loss of rural lands to urban use. Because of these alarming statistics, I wanted to know what Fort Worth was doing to help the pollinators and in turn wanted to see how I could help. Fort Worth has several thousand acres of open spaces, including parkland, medians, right-of-ways, and 400 acres of alleys, which is where my Southside Fort Worth neighborhoods of Ryan Place and Fairmount neighborhood fit in. In reaching out to others to learn, I'm inspired to see that the 80% of us who live on 3% of the urban land truly can help our pollinators. Mayor Betsy Price recognized that Fort Worth could become a major pollinator destination city. So she signed up for all 24 items of the National Wildlife Federation's Monarch Pledge. This makes Fort Worth a National Wildlife Federation designated champion city. I've provided a, a link to the Monarch Pledge and I think you guys are going to get a PDF handout which to which you can then hot link these uh, links that I've got throughout the presentation. I hope in going to that link it'll help you to see what's going on in this neighborhood. Part of the Monarch Pledge as a highlight includes having an annual Monarch Day on the first Saturday in October, although I suspect 2020 may have this event be virtual if it happens at all. Fort Worth has made over 97 acres of land available to a variety of organizations, and I'll mention but two projects that are going on to create pollinator-friendly areas but there are many more such projects than just the two. I'm going to, one I'll mention, the other will be my project. The Native Plant Society of Texas has worked with the city of Fort Worth's Parks Department and created a monarch works way station at the Forest Park Swimming Pool. This project was my first introduction to what was being done in our city. The second project I'll be discussing is my Pollinator Pathway Alley pilot program in Ryan Place. As I mentioned earlier, Fort Worth has around 400 acres of alleys, and the two south side neighborhoods of Ryan Place and Fairmount have approximately 10% of those acres. My Ryan Place alleys have been around since the early 1900s and were originally where the garbage delivery and utility vehicles would gain needed access to the homes. Now the alleys are used for utility vehicles to have access and little else. Rather than to continue mowing the alley behind my home for utility vehicle access, I decided to create a useful pollinator friendly pocket prairie similar to what Botanical Research Institute of Texas or BRIT has done. Only I wanted more native flowers than what they have. Obviously, this was going to be a long-term project to achieve such a vision. So, in 2017, I began, and I call it the Pollinator Pathway Alley Pilot Project, or Pollinator Pathway for short. Prior to starting this project, I enlisted my many helpers and developed a plan. I consulted with Britt and gathered lessons learned from a few Native Plant Society of Texas members on their Forest Park Monarch Waystation project. 
I had been creating an organic and sustainable garden around my home since 2000, so I already had a number of helpers, from my bats, red-tailed hawk, variegated, variegated fritillaries, praying mantids, ladybugs, as well as my heavy lifter helper named Carlos Romero. I decided to take an herbicide-free approach, which I knew was going to be a mission impossible plan, since all my watering drains onto the alley, creating one of the luscious Bermuda and St. Augustine stands around. I really should have made it into a putting green. Rather than use glyphosate, also known as Roundup, I decided to solarize the alley using black plastic. I realized this would bait, kill many of my soil microorganisms, but I also thought it might bake and kill the Bermuda and St. Augustine roots too. Bottom line, I thought this a less harmful approach than using synthetic herbicides. Step one was to scalp the entire 60 foot by 10 foot section of alley. Step two was to spread black plastic along the alley and secure it with lawn stakes. I have been told clear, black, clear plastic would have been better but I thought the ground would get hotter and maybe kill more of the Bermuda and St. Augustine roots with black plastic. Besides, it was more readily available. I solarized this area from mid-July through mid-October. During this July through October time frame, I had a Monarch Way Station sign in the Pollinator Pathway Alley to generate some buzz from my neighbors. I sure did get a lot of questions, so it gave me an opportunity to meet kindred spirits along the path of helping our pollinators. All during that period of time, I saved all of my recyclable paper, newspapers, grocery sacks, and broken down boxes. My plan was that after removing the solarizing black plastic, I would place water-saturated recycled paper on top of the soil. The next two slides will show the late October 2017 steps we took to prepare the soil for its winter rest. I gathered all the recyclable paper and saturated them with my water sprinklers and buckets and whatever I could find. Meanwhile, Carlos Romero's team removed the black plastic along with the garden staples, exposing the bare and cooked soil. We then started placing the, sat the water-saturated recyclable paper over the bare and cooked soil. Once the water-saturated recyclable paper was placed atop the bare and cooked soil, we started spreading the pollinator pathway alley with compost and then with wood chips. With the compost and wood chips spread, the area was ready to plant, and I watered it in but did not sow native seeds until one month later. I kept watering the planted pollinator uh, pathway alley to minimize erosion and to make sure the native seeds did not dry out. That is, once I planted the alleyway. Shown in the garden areas are a few of my native flowers, including the fall asters, Mexican marigolds, blue mist flower and lantanas that have been growing in a healthy ecosystem since around 2000. The photo below this, you can see my Turk's cap, which has gone wild under the bay window. To the right of that photo are a, a number of nectar-rich goldenrod to help in the fall migration. I've also been told, and I need to check with some entomologist experts, that this is one of the favorite overwintering plants for ladybugs. I don't know if, it's, if that's truly correct, but I do know that in the following spring, I saw a lot of ladybug larvae in that general area. So maybe that is correct. I'll need to check with Gail Manning. The bottom row of photos, this one shows a magnified image of a social wasp. I think it's a paper wasp, not sure. And to the right, you can see a monarch sipping nectar from my Asclepius tuberosa. 
aren't you impressed? I know the Latin name, better known as butterfly milkweed. This has a less irritating white milky sap than the more native and more poisonous green milkweed, which is Asclepius viridis, or the and then the antelope milkweed, which is also called Asclepius asperula. The latter two more native milkweeds are much more toxic than the butterfly milkweed, much more irritating to your skin. So you may choose to plant more butterfly milkweed if you've got children to mitigate any itching skin or burning eyes if they're handling the milkweeds. What the pollinator pathway alley looks like in both the spring and summer of 2018 or year one. Admittedly, it is rather barren. But in the spring and onwards and even to this day, my main labor is preventing the Bermuda and St. Augustine from taking over. I don't know if you can see, but a few wine cups are blooming and I'm letting the native horse herb ground cover spread. I'm showing you my other native wildflowers in the garden to distract you from the rather barren alley, as well as remind you I have an already healthy ecosystem surrounding this project. I have fennel, which is a host plant to the black swallowtail caterpillars. And there's a cater picture of the caterpillar. And then you see here two black, uh, one black swallowtail, two photos of one drying out from a rainstorm. In the summer of 2018, the pollinator pathway is getting a bit more filled in with horse herb, prairie verbena, and pink primrose. The Maximilian sunflowers are growing along the fence line. The other native flowers you see include trumpet vine, salvias, Blackfoot daisy, and Datura reichii, which is the luscious white flower that Georgia O'Keeffe made famous. Next is the pollinator pathway 2019 year two status for both spring and summer. As you can see, it is looking much fuller with plants, among them being horse herb, pink primrose, prairie verbena, and frog fruit. The frog fruit is a host plant for several smaller butterflies and is almost out competing the Bermuda and St. Augustine. Hence, I am a huge fan. I've taken a close up of a painted lady butterfly sipping on a Mexican hat. On the lower left, you can see my yellow Callilophus and blue salvias, along with a non-native red amaryllis. In the summer of 2019, the photo was taken right after I had gotten a warning notice from the city of Fort Worth that they would be mowing the alleys. I took that as an opportunity to call the Fort Worth alley manager, John Eric Eubanks, and explain to him what I was trying to do with the Pollinator Pathway Alley project. He was very excited and supportive. He said the only way he could ensure the maintenance crews would not mow the area down was for me to use yellow tape around the growing area. In other words, I was to make the area look like a crime scene. I was tempted to add a body shape inside the yellow taped off area. It certainly helped to gain the city support, when the, especially with the garden looking so lovely with the blooming pink monarda and the pink primrose. The butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa, and the green milkweed, Asclepius viridis, are in their second year and beginning to look good. The city, especially John Eric Eubanks, has become an Now you can see the pollinator pathway 2020 year three for both spring and summer. In typical 2020 fashion, the worst happened, and it was a risk I knew existed with regards to the project in the alley. Atmos Energy announced it was installing new gas lines in our Ryan Place neighborhood, which meant 
all the alleys would be getting torn up. Fearing the worst, I talked with the workmen and asked if there was any way they could minimize tearing up my pollinator pathway alley. As it turned out, I found many more kindred spirits who were also interested in helping our pollinators. True to their word, these workmen did everything in their power to minimize the damage I had seen occurring in everyone else's alleys. Later, after they completed their digging up, I called Atmos Energy and praised the contractors who had done everything possible to protect my pollinator pathway alley. Well, even though the damage was minimized, my pollinator pathway alley is looking rather ragged this summer. But we did plant additional antelope milkweed and green milkweed. And the Maximilian sunflowers, I didn't get as good a shot as I should have, are spreading and the frog fruit are doing extremely well. 2020 is a transformational year for not only our planet, but also the pollinator pathway. Well, I hope you're seeing that you can help pollinators and getting ideas on what you can do. Ways you can help are to plant native plants, which include host plants, nectar, seed and fruit bearing plants, providing shelter, as well as plenty of fresh water. By the way, be very careful on your plant and seed sources, for many may be GMO or neonicotinoid coated seeds. This will make your plants poisonous to the pollinators, so be careful. On a positive note, I saw a Lowe's ad stating that they were not providing neonics in their nursery plants. They use the term neonic. That is good news. Eliminate synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides, just in case you didn't get that message. And reduce your lawn spaces by increasing use of native plants and plant growing areas. The Native Plant Society of Texas has some very good recommendations for plantings in this area. Mow your easements, right-of-ways, alleys, but twice a year to encourage native plants to set seed and spread. Encourage use of consistent signage so people may begin to ask you questions about what you're doing. A reasonably priced one is made from the Monarch Watch Group. I've provided a link here. So reach out to inspire, educate, and collaborate. In summary, encourage one another, share lessons learned, and keep learning. Work with your city employees, including city council representatives, and let them know you are wanting to help the pollinators. They can become one of your biggest advocates. Plant native plants and let native weeds continue to grow. Decrease the vast expanses of lawns by increasing the pollinator pathways. Mow easements, right-of-ways, and alleys, but twice a year to encourage the native plant growth. Please, let's help make Texas pollinator friendly. These last four slides contain resources, which include on this page, some recommended Texas native plants, and it gives you advice on the different regions, local groups to join. Next slide has Facebook groups to join, where to purchase native plants and seeds. Next page has a general list of uh, national organizations, as well as City of Fort Worth link to Mayor Betsy's National Wildlife Federation Monarch Pledge and a list of Fort Worth pollinator related activities. And the last slide has additional national societies and a few of my favorite books. As a reminder, please buy your books from a local book bookseller such as Monkey and Dog here in Fort Worth. We need to support our local brick and mortar businesses. I hope this gets you excited about helping our pollinators who in turn will help us to create healthy soils and foods.